Oh wait, did it escape away? Today we are going to take Aeneas um, away from Carthage and have sort of an interesting interlude in the story. Um, as you recall last time, Aeneas had spent a year in Carthage in what had seemed to be a healthy, loving relationship with Dido, perhaps manipulated by the goddess Venus, his mother, and the goddess Juno, who was looking after Carthage. But when the gods told Aeneas that he had to leave because of his duty, he jumps at the call and leaves that same day. It's a bad end between him and Dido. And Aeneas is very clearly full of regret as he leaves Carthage. Um, he's looking back, actually, as they're sailing away, and he sees a bonfire on the beach and feels like a tug on his heartstrings. But as they're leaving, um, their plan is to go back to Sicily. And they pass through a uh, storm on the way there, um, nothing nearly as bad as the one that brought them to Carthage. And when they land there, they're in the kingdom of another Trojan named Acestes. He's a very minor character in this. But this guy had connections going back to Troy. They'd stopped at a city on the way back. And Aeneas is reminded um, of the date. And he realizes that it's been a year since his father died. And the tradition in the ancient world was to have something that they would call funeral games. These are memorials for great heroes, um, for prizes for victors. And they're not violent games. They're athletic events. So races are very popular, chariots, horse drawn, um, you know, horse riding, um, things like wrestling and boxing and foot races, uh, boat races, archery contests, all sorts of things. The Romans instituted a practice of performing them on anniversaries, whereas as far as I can tell, the Greeks just did them once when the hero was dead. This is a feature you see in epic poetry before. The Iliad has um, the funeral games of Patroclus hosted by Achilles, who gives away prizes that he'd won in battle. Some of the other tales of the Trojan War talk about Achilles' funeral games, where Agamemnon, interestingly enough, is the one presiding and giving stuff away. In any case, this is a chance for people to show valor outside of combat. It's a chance for people to mourn and memorialize great deeds that the person that the person performed when they were alive. Um, a lot of times for a hero in battle, it was things that they had won at other funeral games or in battles that were given away. There's a bunch of events. This takes up almost an entire book of the Aeneid. Um, very famously, there's a boat race that goes really well. There's a foot race that involves a couple of people who are very close friends and possibly, you know, more than that. Um, prizes are given away. And one of the things we see with Aeneas is that he's very careful about form, um, shows his respect again for his father, and he's extremely generous. Everybody who participates gets a prize. And he's usually fairly careful about not um, snubbing anybody with the prizes in the way that sometimes Achilles was in the Iliad. The most interesting one to me is the boxing match. And this goes between um, Ares and Entellus. Um, boxing in the ancient world was a big deal. It was a very, very old kind of sport. And even in friendly matches with this, they would wear the same kind of gloves that they would use for war, something they'd call a kestis. Um, this is a bit closer to hand wraps than modern boxing gloves. And then they would put weights in them, sometimes held between the fingers, sometimes um, taped up to the front of the knuckles. Um, you could kill people with these. Um, connecting to Roman history, gladiators uh, occasionally fought using kesti, um, these big boxing gloves. And I believe, although I'm forgetting the source at this point, that there's actually a gladiator who fought with just these um, these knuckles, these boxing gloves, against armed opponents, people who had swords and shields and stuff, and would win. Darius is a Trojan. He's a younger man, um, but he is a veteran of Troy, so he can't be that young. And there's a local Sicilian champion named Entellus, who's the only person who's willing to go up against Darius. Um, when Darius throws his gloves into the ring to show that he's ready to start and flexes, literally no one else is willing to do it until this older boxer, Entellus, comes in. Entellus is past his prime. Um, and it starts off with Darius being young and using sort of his maneuverability to attack under sort of Entellus's ribs. Entellus does make a really big swing. Um, and misses and actually falls to the ground. And Aeneas and other people help this person back up, and he gets back in the fight. Um, Dares does have the youth, the vigor, the maneuverability, but Intellus is frighteningly strong, and his tactics are good. He switches it up, and then he starts going for body blows as well, wearing down Dares. Um, after a while, Intellus is the only one throwing punches. Um, Virgil describes it that his blows are raining down like hailstorm on the roof of a city, um, a really lovely simile. Aeneas stops the fight because they're worried about Antellus killing Darius. And the old man, showing that he, you know, his strength, his power, you know, does spare Darius, 
and then takes the bull that they were going to sacrifice and brains it, just hits it once in the forehead and kills it on the spot with one blow. Um, for context, normally you would use an ax to do this and it didn't always work. There's some symbolism in here. Um, again, we see old and new in conflict. Um, if you think way back to Aeneas carrying his father, um, people who are older or younger can mention, can go with, um, sorry, can represent bigger ideas with this, but that's something we'll get into another time. As the funeral games were winding down, there's a couple of miraculous occurrences. Um, the archery contest um, is kind of ambiguous because while one person does actually hit the flying target, a bird that was released, the other person's arrow spontaneously bursts into flames in the sky and everyone considers it an omen. Juno is looking down on this though, and she's still not done persecuting the Trojans. She sends her messenger down and has them sort of sowing doubt into the Trojan women. The pervading idea that this messenger from Juno sends, sends down that Sicily is fine, it's lush, it's green, there's friendly people here, and they don't know why people would have to keep going forward. In a desperate maneuver, some of these Trojan women, again, completely manipulated by Juno, set fire to a few of the Trojan ships. And it's only when Aeneas and some of the other men notice this that they immediately pray for help and are answered with a rainstorm that comes down immediately. This is a scary moment, and Aeneas takes a good look at his situation. Um, he's persuaded by a local seer that the best course of action is to let individual people decide what they want to do. Um, and what ends up happening is a lot of people who are more vulnerable, older people, younger people, some of these women who never wanted to leave in the first place, end up staying in Sicily as Aeneas and the rest of people press on to Italy. They hear of where they're supposed to be going next. Um, specifically, there is a temple in Kumai where a seer lives. And Aeneas hears all these things and is weighing his options when he gets a vision of his father, the ghost of his father, telling him to listen to this particular vision and to seek him out for more advice. Um, the next time that we um, see him, the next video that we come together in, and this is actually going to have to create, uh, do a staple of these epic journeys. He's going to have to go to the underworld and return while alive in order to get advice from his father. This is a nice little interlude in the story. Um, it's a relaxing moment that, that turns sour. It has this bit with the ships being burned, but luckily nothing huge ends up coming of it. The Chance for Aeneas to show his piety. This is again a little bit more character development on his part. Um, just showing that even after you know this whole bit in Carthage, yes, he cares about custom, he cares about tradition, he cares about doing things the right way. We're almost done with the first half of Aeneas's story. Um, after this, he travels to the underworld and then he goes on to Italy. And the thing is, in Italy, we know and Aeneas knows that he's going to have to fight. It's not going to be easy for him. Take care, and I'll see you all in the next video.